Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians has been called the warfare book of the Bible, the warfare uh, chapter of the Bible, this would be called. It talks about the reality of the warfare that you and I are involved in. Whether we believe it or not, we are in it. It is real, and we need to be aware of it. Follow as I read along, starting at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, and proclaiming it that I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak. What a wonderful portion of God's Word as we look at spiritual warfare this morning. Do you believe in spiritual warfare? Is it real to you? Is the devil real to you? Are demons real to you? You say, oh, Pastor Bill, I try not to think about those things at all. I, I kind of think about God and concentrate on Him. Well, it's good to think about God and it's good to concentrate on Him. But if that's the only thing you think about and concentrate on, my dear friend, you have a blind spot. We have much information about Satan and the demonic realm in Scripture, and God has put it there for a reason, to know it, to study it, to be aware of what the enemy of your soul and my soul is doing. And he is quite active. So it behooves us this morning to look at this text and to look at it carefully and to take it very seriously in this spiritual warfare in which we're all involved in. There was once a boxer who was being pummeled in the ring by his opponent. Blow after blow left him with a bloody nose, swollen eyes, and an enormous amount of pain. The battered boxer's trainer, trying to encourage his man, between the rounds, said, Hey, you're doing great, Fred. The bum is barely touching you. To which the boxer replied, Then you better keep your eye on the referee because someone is killing me. In some way, you and I are engaged in a real battle, one of cosmic proportions. And we need to pay attention to that. We know we're facing a real opponent because we bear the bloody, painful scars of this conflict. Wars among nations, shattered lives, broken homes, suicide, rape, abuse, immorality of every kind. And my goal this morning is to help us to see the battle in which you and I are engaged in. First and foremost, it is the Lord's battle, not ours only. Only when we see this, dear friends, you and I are going to be able to gain the victory. So, I'm making a declaration this morning. You and I are at war. We are at war, and we better believe it. 
In fact, we're engaged right now, as one has said, the mother of all battles. No war in history can compare with spiritual warfare. It can be either the cause of your greatest joy as a Christian or your deepest pain, if that especially is a blind spot in your life. Let's take a look at our text this morning and look more at this. First of all, it talks about the armor of God. It talks about being equipped for the battle. Let's look at verse 10. And we're talking about spirit-filled believers here because it's only spirit-filled believers that can have victory in spiritual warfare, that we're walking in the spirit, that we're being controlled by the spirit. Verse 10, it talks about the warrior's power. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Literally, that means be made powerful in the Lord. You and I need to be made powerful. We don't have the strength. This is not a warfare of superhuman strength, but rather supernatural power, supernatural strength. Human strength will not be enough. You and I cannot fight Satan and the demonic realm just by willing to do so, just by being determined, just by being angry at him and them. It won't work. You see, it tells us to be strong in ourselves, doesn't it? No. It says to be strong in the Lord. That is the only place where we get our strength. That is the only place where we have our strength in the Lord. So the question is, am I in the Lord? Well, we're either in Adam or in the Lord. Either we're saved or unsaved. If we're in Adam alone and not in the Lord, we will not have the power resources to deal with Satan. If we are in the Lord and yielding to the Lord, then we have supernatural strength. Then we can be made powerful. Might I say that this power is a delegated power? It's not our power. It's not a power that we brag about. Oh, look at me, boy. I can make the devil run. Uh, I have victory over the demonic realm. Don't believe it for one moment. It is a delegated power. It is given to us to use for our good and His glory, the advancement of the kingdom of God. Finally, so he's concluding this book, be strong. He wants us to be strong. Christians are called to be strong. If there's any day that we need to be strong is today. Be strong. But it qualifies that in the Lord and in the strength of His might and in His mighty power. You and I do not understand, cannot even imagine the mighty strength and power of God. We cannot. It is beyond us. No computer could calculate it. It is beyond calculation. But that power is made available for you and for me to live the Christian life in warfare. So this battle will need supernatural strength. No amount of weight training, gymnastics, or physical discipline will help in this battle. Not at all. Not against keeping in shape and taking care of yourself. But this is a supernatural battle. It needs supernatural strength and power. Then he goes on. He talks about the warrior's armor in verse 11 and actually other verses. In verse 11, he says, Now if you're going to engage in this battle, you need armor. You need armor. He says, Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So this not only tells us about our armor, it tells us about our enemy. And more information is given about our armor and our enemy. The devil has schemes. The devil has plans. He has stratagems. He has devices all geared to you, to your marriage, to your life, uh, to everything, to your witness, to your testimony, to your joy, to your peace, to your stability. He has all kinds of plans and stratagems to take you apart, to make you ineffective for Christ, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your life, to destroy your reputation, and even if possible, 
the ultimate, to take your life. He has all kinds of plans. The schemes of the devil. But the way we can resist that is to put on. Now you notice there it says put on. God doesn't put it on for us. We are called individually, daily, to put on the armor of God. This is something we do through faith, by prayer. And this is a picture of Roman armor. Paul was in a Roman jail. So he used the pieces that a Roman soldier would use. You know, the helmet, the breastplate, the sword, and so on. Okay, so we have that imagery that Paul uses to explain for us. Now he says, I want you to put on this armor. I won't put it on for you. You have to do it by faith, by prayer. It's our responsibility to, do it, uh, to, to put on that armor. So he says, put on the full armor of God. Don't go partly clad. Put on the full armor of God. It's not your armor. It's God's armor. Okay? Why? That you may be able to stand firm. God wants you and me to stand firm. He wants you and me to be strong. And dear friend, we, know, we need to stand firm. Because all of the temptations of the world today, all of the bombardments of the evil one, are constantly hitting at us. Some are outright despicable that we reject. Others are quite tempting and pleasurable that would wear us down and lure us away from God. All kinds of strategies, and he knows exactly what he needs for each one of us. And if this doesn't work, well, maybe that one will work. And if that one failed in your case, well, I have something else I'll try on you. And he goes on and on and on with his schemes. But our goal is to stand firm. Are you standing firm this morning? Are you standing firm in the Lord? Do you have that victory in Christ? How important it is. You know, and we just don't want to get by. We weren't called just to get by. We were called to have victory. Victory. You know, some people settle for, well, two horsepower instead of a hundred horsepower. Let me tell you a little story about that. Oil was discovered on some Oklahoma property belonging to an elderly Indian. All his life, he had been poverty stricken, eking out a living. But the discovery of oil had suddenly been made, and he was a wealthy man. The first thing he did was to buy a very big Cadillac. He wanted the longest car in the county, so he added four square, uh, spare tires on the trunk. He would dress it up in his new clothes, dress up in his new clothes every day, and he would take his Cadillac into the hot, dusty little town nearby. <coughs> Excuse me. He wanted to, he wanted everyone to see him. And he wanted to see everyone. He was a friendly old soul. So when he was riding through the town, he would turn in all directions and wave to all the people as he rolled by. Interestingly enough, he never ran into anybody or anything. The reason for this was that directly in front of that big, beautiful auto were two horses harnessed to it and pulling it. There was nothing wrong with the car's engine. It was because the old Indian had never learned to drive it. He had never learned how to insert the key in the ignition and turn the switch on. Under the hood was a hundred power plus horse, horsepower ready to be, and rearing to go, but the old Indian was content to use the two horsepower hooked up in front of the car. Now you see the devil gets really happy, as happy as he can get when he can keep the believer chugging along in their Christian life on two horsepower. At that rate of spiritual progress, that'll bring us down to a crawl, and that's exactly what he's after. Dear friend, some of us may be here this morning, including myself, just operate on two horsepower. When we have so much more power available for us in the Christian life, and we don't use it. Could it be that like so many Christians, we're just not aware of how to use the armor we have, the weapons we have in spiritual warfare, and we're settling for less. We have far more defeat in our lives. Our joy is often taken away. 
We feel blah about the Christian faith. We don't see the real victory. We don't see the real change in our life. Could it be we're weak against the enemy and we're operating at a very low ebb? You see, he's given us this armor, you see. It's a divine armor. It's God's armor. It's available for us. We cannot fight the war without it. But we must know how to use it and put it on. You know, there's something good about the armor of God. It exposes things as they really are. When we use the pieces of the armor, it lets us see the enemy more clearly. But when you and I don't have that armor on, I tell you, we're an open target for the enemy. General Peter Cosgrove, in the re he was a recently retired chief Australian Defense Force member. In his autobiography, he tells about his first tour of duty as a young lieutenant in Vietnam. His first posting at the base was near the village of Dat Do. The purpose of the base was to house army engineers. These Aussie soldiers would use giant bulldozers with a huge chain dragged between them to rip down the vegetation. The purpose of this was to deny the enemy any possibility of concealment in the jungle. So huge tracts of jungle were just ripped down and burnt so that no one could hide. The Aussies were removing any camouflage that might possibly be used for evil purposes. And dear friends, in dealing with our spiritual enemies, we have to pull down, we have to lay flat the jungle in order to identify them. Once they're identified, we can better deal with them. That is why you and I need spiritual weapons. That is why you and I need the armor of God that we may lay bare the jungle that we're about every day of our lives, that we might clearly see the enemy working and coming at us and see where they are. <clears throat> now, in verse 12, it tells us what we're battling against. Now, we were told Satan already and all of his stratagems. Verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now wrestle or struggle there comes from a Greek word which means to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's that close. So when we do spiritual warfare, we are that close to the enemy, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And I suppose if we could see the demonic realm around us as well as the angelic realm, if God allowed us a glimpse, we could see right in this church building them surrounding us, all around us. And just about everywhere we go, they are all over. And we just seem to be completely unaware of it because we can't see them visually with our eyes. But when we are in spiritual warfare, we are wrestling. We are dealing with hand-to-hand -hand combat, not with flesh and blood. Sometimes we think, well, people are our enemies. Well, ultimately behind people. The one who pulls the strings, the one who's orchestrating it all, the one who's making it work, the master planner of evil, is Satan and his vast network of the demonic realm. Now you notice it says, rulers, powers, world forces, spiritual forces of evil. Most conservative scholars look at those and look at those as rankings of the, the demonic realm, rankings of fallen angels if you will, that we call demons today. And dear friend, there is no way we can win against them unless we are putting on the armor of God. You see, they are organized. They are well organized to do battle. And they are aiming against you and me to destroy us, especially because we represent Christ. So, what do we do? How do we handle it? 
since we are their target. And we better believe we're their target. We better believe it's real. And that's part of the problem, I think, with many Christians. Somehow we read this and we say, oh, yeah, well, I guess so. Yeah, there are devils, demons out there, whatever. But it doesn't seem to affect us. We say, I've never seen a demon. I've never seen the devil. Oh, I believe he's real. The Bible says he's real, so I guess he's real. But I've never seen a dear friend. You don't have to see them. You haven't seen God either, and you believe he's real, right? The fact is, they are real. And this is what God's word tells us. We better wake up to the reality of what is reality. That this is what's happening. And lest this becomes our worldview, dear friends, we're going to be defeated. You see, there are only three realms in this world. God, the realm of God himself. Two, angels, either good or demonic. That includes Satan. And three, man, mankind. And those three levels, that's it. That comprises everything. What are we to do? Verse 13, therefore, in view of all of this, in view of the battle we're in, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You're going to need it, not just part of it, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Because the evil day is coming. Now, there's a general sense. We're in warfare every day. But in your life and in my life, they'll come that day or those days when you and I will undergo very strong attack. Very strong attack. And it may be the greatest challenge of our lives. So just because that may not have happened yet, don't think it won't. I believe it's coming for each one of us. So we're told we're to take up that armor. We're to take it up. Once again, it's us. We need to take it up. We have to exercise our will. Take up that armor that you may be able to stand in that evil day. And you know, you'll know when that evil day comes. You'll know when you go through the toughest struggle you've ever went through in your life. You'll know when you'll despair of life. And I tell you, Paul did even despair of life at times. He went through so much. And we're going to be tried. We're going to be tested. Dear friends, we're in the last days. The scripture tells us that. So the battle is real. We have real enemies. So we, have, we need real armor to protect ourselves. Not only that, but to withstand the enemy and to stand firm. I want to ask you again, are you standing firm today? Are you standing firm? Do you believe you're really in a battle? Do you believe in spiritual warfare? Do you believe what this text is saying this morning? And if somehow it seems unreal to you and it just doesn't click, you better get back to it. There's something wrong. There's something happening. Don't leave this text until you're sure that you believe it, that it's real, and that you're going to take seriously the armor of God. If you do, you'll make one of the greatest mistakes in your Christian life. I really believe that. Verse 14, Therefore, stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, now he's going through the parts of the armor here, the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. I like to look at the belt of truth as truth holding everything together, but basically... The belt of truth, meaning the truth, the absolute truth of the Word of God. You see, the enemy cannot withstand the truth of the Word of God. Jesus used the Word of God when he was attacked in Matthew 4 and other places by Satan. He used the Word of God, the absolute truth of the Word of God. And this is why we need to spend time in the Word of God and fill ourselves with it and think it and live it out and share it and use it because this is the only thing that can expose the enemy the word of god god's absolute truth we live in a world today where uh, truth is not absolute it's relative or truth is postmodern it probably really doesn't exist anymore but the fact is god says it does jesus said he is the truth ultimately the truth is a person but we also have the body of the christian faith the body of knowledge that he's given us in the bible this is the truth, the absolute truth that Satan and the demonic realm 
cannot withstand. And as long as we're walking in that truth, we have it strapped around us, dear friend, you and I will have the victory. Then it says the breastplate of righteousness. Now the, the Roman breastplate covered just that, his chest. It protected his heart. Two things about that. The breastplate of righteousness, number one, it means the imputed righteousness that Christ has given to you. The imputed righteousness. You say, what do you mean by that? The moment you were saved, Christ gave you his very own righteousness. So when God looks at you through his son Jesus, he sees that righteousness placed to your account. And that always stays with you. That never changes. That always stays the same. But then again, in terms of sanctification, our daily sanctification, there's that practical righteousness, living for God, becoming more and more like Jesus. And dear friends, if that breastplate is to stay in place, we need to not only make sure we're saved, have that imputed righteousness of Christ, but living day by day in obedience to the Word of God, living out His life in us, living a life of holiness and practical righteousness. When we do that, the enemy can't get in. He'll try, but the enemy can't get in because we're walking in right. See, the enemy is the accuser. And as soon as you and I slip and do something unrighteous, do something outright sinful, the enemy says, aha, you claim to be a Christian? Look at what you did. Would a real Christian do that? Don't tell me you're a Christian. Oh, how he loves to do that. And he does that time and time again. And he can be very convincing to the point where a Christian might feel, well, I guess I'm not saved at all. The fact is, we are to walk in righteousness Put in that breastplate of righteousness. What are we talking about? We're talking about every day, in a real sense, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Saying, Lord, I give myself to you. I put you on as I would my, my clothes. I put you on as I would my garments. I put you on, as this is describing here, as armor ready for a battle. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. Boy, unless we get a hold of that, then Satan's going to get a hold of us. We'll never have that victory. I can't tell you my experiences through the years that I've had with this, either personally and with other folks that are just absolutely incredible. The reality that is there. My own grandmother was in necromancy. That's right. People came to her to speak to the dead. And her voice would change. And she had quite a clientele back in her own hometown in Fall River quite popular, and she was a healer of sorts. But the fact is, I realized when I became a Christian, my grandmother didn't get this power from God. It was from the evil one. Sad to say, and it was hard for me to admit. I remember sharing that with my father one day as a young Christian. I thought he was going to knock my block off, saying that about his mom. But the fact is, that was the reality of it. And many who come from the old country Look at these things as gifts. Some people have these gifts in the old country that they use them. These gifts, if they are, they're not from God. It's very, very real and very much there. And it's being exercised. Then he goes on to say, verse 15, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness of the gospel of peace. Now the shoes represent the gospel gives our feet or our lives support and stability. The gospel gives our feet or our lives support and stability as we live it out. So it acts, acts as shoes, so to speak. I love Isaiah 33, 6 that says, And he will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. Love that verse. And it is. And that was being told to the exiles who'd be in Babylon for 70 years, that God would be with them and be their stability. Verse 16, he says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. In addition to all, in addition to all I've just said, he says, take up the shield of faith. Now, this shield of faith is faith in what? Not faith in faith. Faith in itself is empty. Faith needs an object. Faith is like an empty hand. It needs hand. It needs something to grasp onto. Faith in Christ. 
faith in His promises, faith in the truth of the Word of God. And we take up that shield. In Roman days, it was a shield two and a half feet by four feet. Didn't cover the back, just the front. And it was covered with leather, and it could extinguish these flaming arrows, these flaming projectiles, these missiles coming at it, and put it out. And dear friends, when doubt comes and attacks you, when the, uh, the several, uh, devil tries to bring condemnation upon you, when all kinds of evil thoughts come your way, thoughts that tear about your worth and your person, your identity, your salvation, fears, anxieties, they all come at you. You lift up that shield of faith, which is faith in Christ, faith in His promises, faith in the Word of God. You lift it up, and it catches all of us. And they can't get through you. You see, we need that shield of faith that we lift up every day. It will extinguish that. Maybe there are some of you this morning, some of those arrows have got through. Some of those projectiles, some of those missiles have got through and it hit you right in the heart. And, and this morning you're down. You're discouraged. You believe the lie. And he got in there somehow. Well, just confess that to God. Get right with God. Feed upon his word and lift up that shield again. You know, I like to collect the promises of the word of God because they're so powerful. You know, get three by fives and write them down. Promises that deal with, say, for instance, fear. Fear is a big thing today, so write down key promises. Promises that deal with death. A lot of folks are really afraid of dying, even Christians. Write down those promises that deal with dying. Promises that deal with sexual lust and temptation. Write down those promises of deliverance. Promises that deal with greed and money or power. Write down those promises. Whatever is happening in your life, however you feel like you're being tempted, however you feel like Satan might have an opening in your life, Write down those promises that deal with those areas on three by fives. A practical way to do it. Label it on one side what it is and carry it with you and review them. Because see, when the enemy shoots those darts at you, those missiles, you want to lift up those promises, the shield of faith, right then and there, and it will block it. It will stop it, and you'll have the victory. But not only that, you'll be able to share it with others, not just keep it to yourself. We all need each other's help. And then it says the helmet of salvation. Now we know Satan works through the mind, doesn't he? It guards our mind and our thoughts. So that space between our ears, Satan spends a lot of time there, interjecting thoughts and temptations and fears and anxieties. You know, he, he, he brings up the, the, the woulda, coulda, shouldas, and uh, what I would have, if I only would have did that, or I should have did that, or I, I could have did that, and we worry about that. And then he brings out the future, the what ifs. What if this happens, and what if that happens, and, and so on. So we're dealing with the woulda, coulda, shouldas. We're dealing with the what ifs and everything in between. And boy, he's working on us, and we're all working. Guess, guess what? We have no more, more joy. He's stolen our joy. He's stolen our peace. We can't walk in victory. And he says, great, I've got him operating in two horsepower. That's fantastic. He loves to do that. So the helmet guards our thoughts, our thought life. What am I thinking? What are my thoughts? The scripture says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is good and true and pure, it says dwell on these things. It says ponder these things. Those are the things that we need to ponder. I can tell you how victorious a Christian is during the week just by the things that they think about. You tell me what you're thinking about, I tell you what I'm thinking about, and you can tell me how victorious I am. Because if I'm thinking fear and worry and anxiety and the woulda, coulda, shouldas and the what ifs, I'm not going to be very victorious. And if you're doing the same, neither will you. But if we're thinking about, hey, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. If God be for me, who, who can be against me? That we overwhelmingly conquer through him that loved us. If I'm thinking those thoughts and believing those thoughts and walking in that truth, dear friend, I'm going to be victorious, operating in 100 horsepower, and Satan's going to flee, and the demonic realm is going to know it. And we're going to be that light and that salt that God intended us to be. So he uses the mind. He works through the mind. And we, so we've got to have that el helmet. Now, the helmet of salvation, the word salvation there, means deliverance. It means security. It means preservation. And God wants to deliver our mind from that. He wants to preserve our mind from that. He wants to secure us. So we'll have a mind that only thinks God's thoughts. 
instead of letting the evil one come in. And sometimes the evil one knocks at the door of our mind. He says, come on, let me in. I'm really a friend. I'm really a friend of yours. Come on, let me in. Let's have coffee cake and sit down together. But the fact is, once it gets in, it plants all of those thoughts in fear and worry and anxiety. You see, if faith is in the, the house of your mind, then fear and doubt will stay in. But if fear and doubt come in, then faith will be moved out. They both can't live in the same house together. But we decide by an act of faith and will, who are going to let in our house? It's our choice. Our choice. Then he goes on to say, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and perhaps the only offensive weapon mentioned here. And we're to, learn, we're to learn to use the Word of God. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Really, uh, think about it. Dwell on it. Just bathe ourselves in the Word of God. As we do that, we'll be able to stick the old devil when he comes our way. We can be ready with the Word of God. He wants to catch us unprepared. He wants to catch us not ready. Are our minds filled with the Word of God, Scripture? Then he goes on to pray, and it's interesting. Paul talks about the four alls of prayer. Did you know the four alls of prayer are mentioned in Ephesians 6, 18? The four alls of prayer, in, in more literal translations, you have that. You, it says, pray at all times, with all prayer, with all perseverance, and for all the saints. The four alls of prayer. Pray at all times. We're to call to pray at all times. Be constant in prayer. Be devoted to prayer. You know, we just don't pray when we're hurting. We just don't pray when we're rejoicing. We pray at all times. It's just an attitude of life. When we're driving, when we're uh, shopping, when we're at the bank, when we're walking about, we, we have that in our heart and mind. Talking with God, we're ready in any moment. All prayer, all kinds of prayers. We have the warfare prayers. We have the intercession prayers. We have prayers of thanksgiving. We have prayers of adoration. All kinds of prayers. Prayers of confession. With all perseverance, we just keep it up. We keep praying. And for all the saints, our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just for those that we particularly like, but for everyone, even those maybe we have a hard time getting along with. We pray for them. We pray for all the saints. Why? Because we know they're going through the same things we're going through, and even sometimes worse. Dear friends, this is the kind of life we should have. And you know what Satan hates? He hates evangelism. I mean, he hates a lot of things, but especially that. And you say, why is that? Because, see, when you, you are used to lead a person to Christ, and they come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of Christ, he's lost one. He's lost one. And, oh, does he hate that. Oh, does he, but sometimes we need that boldness to speak out. We need that boldness to speak out for Christ. You know, in Ephesians 19, uh, uh, that is verse 19 of 6, it says, he says, pray also for me that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. The opening of my mouth to what? To make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. He says, I need your prayers so I can speak the gospel boldly. We need to be praying for one another. Lord, just give Sally the strength to witness. Give Bob the, the strength to witness. Praying for one another. Because sometimes we cop out, don't we? Sometimes we have the opportunity right before us to say a word for Christ and we blow it. We say, oh man, I could have said something. I know God was leading me to say something, but I just said, oh, I don't know. They'd probably label me as a religious nut or something. I better shut up. You know, or boy, I've lost enough friends. You know, I don't want to be alone in some island someplace. You know, all kinds of things go through our mind. When God has given us the opportunity, don't worry about those other things. God will take care of those other things. He tells us we need to pray for one another for boldness. Now listen, if the great apostle Paul, a great man of God, needs prayer for boldness to speak out, how much more do, does, do I and you need prayer for boldness? So pray for me as I pray for you. Pray for one another. Pray for other believers. Pray for churches around the world and the country that we might have the boldness to speak out because when we do, God's word gets heard. People listen and people can get saved. And then he goes on to say, he goes on, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly, here's what he says at the end of that verse, as I ought to speak. That's how I ought to be speaking about it, boldly, boldly, as I ought to speak. You know, that makes all the difference. Makes all the difference. Let me close with this story about preparation. 
You and I need to prepare. Do you know a moose prepare? You say, what? Moose, what are you talking about? Moose really do prepare for the battles they have. Well, recently, the National Geographic ran an article about an Alaskan bull moose. The males, uh, the males of the species battle for dominance during the fall breeding season, literally going head to head with antlers crunching together as they collide. Often the antlers are broken, they're only weapons, which ensues defeat. The heftiest moose with the largest, strongest antlers triumphs. Therefore, the battle is fought in the fall, is already won during the summer when the moose eat continually. The one thing that consume, those moose that consume the best diet turn out to be the heaviest, bulkiest, and have the best antlers. So therefore, when season comes for them to be out there, when they meet one another, guess who wins the battle when they collide? The one who's the heaviest and the one with the best and strongest antlers. The one who had been feeding on the best food. What does that tell us? It tells us if we are going to be victorious, much depends on what we do now before the real battle begins. Now, I said in a real sense, we're all in spiritual warfare every day. But they'll come that day. They'll come that day when we are going to be heavy under attack. Will we be able to stand whenever that comes? Here's the principle that we learn from the bull moose. Enduring faith, strength, and wisdom for trials are best developed before they're needed. Before they're needed. So as you and I daily feed upon the Word of God in prayer and walk in faith, and learn the pieces of armor, and learn how to put them on, and walk in victory. Dear friend, when that day comes, for each of us, we're going to be ready. Our antlers won't break. The weapons we'll have will be strong. We'll be heavyweights for God, and we'll be victorious. We will overwhelmingly conquer through His power. I want to ask you now, are you preparing for the spiritual warfare now and the big one to come. Let's pray.